Um, I guess I would start with the fact that from 1991 to 2014, Ukraine had a very mixed history in terms of incomplete reforms. Progress was made, then they went backwards, and in many cases, um, this was caused by vested interests. And the vested interests uh, stopped the reforms from going forward because they weren't in their interest. 2014 was a turning point for Ukraine. After the revolution of dignity, where the Ukrainian people stood up for these European values, for a way of life uh, that was different uh, than Russia's, and the initial invasion, let's not forget, began in 14, in February of 14, with the illegal annexation occupation of Crimea, then Donbass. <clears throat> the Ukrainian government really, really started in 14 and over the last seven, eight years to move forward on the economic reforms that were necessary. So I'll kind of go back to that period and say uh, some of the most critical things which are going to be critical even going forward. One was fiscal restraint and moving from an over 10% of GDP budget deficit to 2%. Redirecting resources such that we were putting from then on at least 5% of our budget, uh, excuse me, 5% of our GDP into the national security. You see the outcome of that today. You see a military standing up to the second largest army in the world and doing it quite successfully. Fiscal decentralization, which was really important and doesn't get enough, uh, enough uh, news, it doesn't get enough headline. We moved revenues down to local communities and we moved revenues down so they wouldn't be coming hat in hand begging in Kiev, as well as not encouraging corruption in that way. That fiscal decentralization created communities and, and regional leaders that you see today taking responsibility and acting without direction from above, without waiting for in, in information, acting to both maintain the economy as well as defend the country. We got through that sovereign debt restructuring, which I think will be an issue that's going to come back in the future. Um, and we started and over the past eight years implemented a great number of institutional mechanisms to improve transparency, which did a couple things, improved efficiency, but also broke down some of the corruption. Those transparency elements were things like Prozoro, which is a procurement system, e-budgeting, which gave everyone in civil society visibility into what was being budgeted and how monies are being spent, and more recently, GIA, a mobile app that the government has introduced to provide services to individuals. You don't have to stand in line. You're not faced with having to provide bribes. All of these transparency elements have an anti-corruption element in, in them. And then lastly, banking reform uh, was very successful in the last eight years. We uh, implemented strong uh, regulation. We eliminated weak banks, banks that had been taken advantage of by their, by their owners. And what you see today is a very resilient banking system and a very professional central bank. So much of today's economic resilience in the face of this unbelievably destructive war is based on the reforms of these eight years. And there are the lessons learned for the going forward. One, we need to keep doing what we did well, managing that deficit right now, as you can well imagine with an almost 35 to 50% GDP contraction expected this year. Uh, the Ukrainian government is reliant on uh, the United States and the EU to cover a substantial budget deficit. It's about $5 billion a month. And that means that they've got to manage that deficit. They're reliant on uh, the Western support, the G7 support, and that support needs to keep coming. Primarily, it should be coming in grant form and not adding to the debt uh, load. But managing that deficit is going to be critical going forward. Second, I would say that we need to strengthen what we didn't finish in these in these past 30 years. We didn't finish the work on anti-corruption. And that means the anti-monopoly, antitrust uh, pieces of the puzzle that were not put in place, that were not implemented. We need to complete privatization and complete getting as much of the assets out of the hands of the state and or vested interests. And we need to finish with rule of law and judicial reform. All of these things are going to be critical to motivating donors and the private sector to come in and rebuild Ukraine. And when I think about rebuilding, I think of kind of three big pieces. One is Ukraine needs to inspire the world with its rebuilding plan, something that the minister just uh, was doing with her description of meeting the challenges of uh, a green climate, of uh, energy efficiency, and of being a major part of the value added uh, 
food security problem and others. So inspire uh, an inspiring story and a, and a story that inspires with uh, its reforms as well as with its building strategy. The second big piece, the sources of capital. Well, I'm sure we're gonna, you're gonna have a second panel that talks about this, but where will the money come from? How will we motivate both the confiscation of Russian frozen assets to be used as part of this rebuilding, if not the bulk of the rebuilding, the G7, the international financial institutions, and finally, the private sector. What confidence building measures do we need to put in place for donors, for the private sector, and for Ukrainian society? Things like an improved procurement system. Prozoro is good, but it's not good enough for the massive amount of construction that's going to have to happen. So an agreed, transparent, monitored, audited procurement system will be one of those confidence building measures. The minister talked about sovereign guarantees of private investment. I'll just talk about political risk insurance provided by MIGA at the World Bank, as well as individual G7 governments, critical. And I'll add to that that given judicial reform is going to take time, even with the best of intentions and actions, there probably should be some kind of court set up with foreign judges operating on UK law, for example, that will provide an immediate source of confidence to the private sector that they have courts to go to that are fair and, and free. And then lastly, there's gonna to need to be a massive coordination amongst the different donors. One of the challenges I had as a government official back in 14, when the world was at our side in Ukraine and supporting us, was that it wasn't well coordinated. And I, as a minister, had to manage you know, some 400 different conditions on each piece of, of funding that we received. And, and I was, it, was, it, was, it was a mess um, from a coordination standpoint. So I would hope that we learned our lessons from the, that period of time and we move forward with a more coordinated effort on the international side. So I think number one is to coordinate the initial macro financial stability effort with the international community. I think we talk a lot about rebuilding, um, which is a large and necessary component of the future, but I'm worried about this $5 billion, $6 billion a month. And I think spending is increasing from what the minister just described with grant programs for the economy. So I would be looking to either negotiate in a, a basic um, IMF program to, to, to serve as the baseline um, and or a longer term negotiation with the G7 and the EU uh, about this satisfying this, this financial, this urgent financial issue. I, I think right now, the United States and the EU have committed three months worth of support and that isn't enough. And I believe that this is gonna to have to come with, with some reforms, although I understand this is not a time for massive economic reform implementation, but I think there needs to be a dialogue with the, with the, uh, with the donors to ensure that they know that that continues, that some of the things that perhaps stopped during uh, the war period will re restart. For example, using Prozoro for certain purchasing, um, that transparency could restart again. So there, I think there are elements that the government can, can put forward as an effort to build confidence but I don't like the idea of Putin waiting us out, that the United States moves into an election period. The, you know, people think that, the, that, that they've finished their job. There is an urgent necessity right now, obviously on the military side in terms of supply of weapons, that goes without question. But on the second is a more medium, I'll call it medium term, meaning a year's worth of planning for the international community to support the basic economy.